We left off last week, if you remember, with the couple in conflict. It was the whole, that's what she said section of Song of Songs, um, starting there in Song of Songs uh, chapter, uh, my, my, my chapter five, verse, tr verse two. This is, this is what I'm trying to read through as I'm lecturing. So sometimes I can't see my verse numbers or chapter numbers. But um, Song of Songs, verse two, and, 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 and basically she says, um, you know, I, was, I, was, I slept but my heart was awake, um, which means she was probably having a restless night of sleep, or, or maybe her husband was like, whatever, a sound, my beloved knocking, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is wet with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. And that's what she said. I had put off my garment. How could I put it on? I bathed my feet. How could I soil them? That's what she said. My beloved stretched his hand to the hole, and my me my heart was thrilled within me. That's what she said. I rose to open to my beloved. That's what she said. And my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved. But my beloved had turned and gone. So she wasn't available to him. And then whenever she gets available to him, he's now not available to her. So she says he's gone, but then he speaks to her. My soul failed me when he spoke. How did he speak to her if he wasn't there? Well, he was there, but he had left her um, in his heart. Or, or maybe it's just poetic language to get this idea across that my, my, I can reach out for my beloved, but my beloved is absent. Whether my beloved is actually in front of me and absent or gone and absent, whatever relationships can have these misread cues, whether in the bedroom or out of the bedroom, we can get into these, these, these places. C.S. Lewis talks about every aspect of your life. We'll go through, I think he calls them uh, peaks and troughs, ebb and flow, peaks and valleys. There's sometimes in life where it, everything just is like rocking and you're like, yes. And then sometimes you get in valleys and you're like, nothing is going right. And I'll never have a happy life ever again. And he says that actually kind of happens in different stages in life. Like in your studies, there's sometimes you're like, dude, this is so awesome. I can't believe I'm learning all this stuff. This is so cool. I love studying. And then you get punched in the gut and you're like, I hate, I'm, I'm, I'm dumb. I'm never going to finish this. I, I'll never graduate. And this is worthless. And, and that's just how everything in our life goes through and relationships are the same way you, if you're in any kind of committed romantic relationship there's going to be times when you're like are we ever going to fight i can't imagine us fighting about anything ever we're it's just great and then you get these points where you're like man are we ever going to see eye to eye i don't feel like we can have a single conversation without major tension and and so that's what we're getting right here is these these misread cues. He's ready for her, but she's not ready for him. And that can happen sexually. It can happen emotionally. Um, and, and then whenever she's ready for him, well, he's already gone because she wasn't open to him. So he's not going to be open to her. And she says, my soul felt me when he spoke. I sought him and found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. Um, so he spoke without being there. And whenever you're absent relationally and you speak out against the person, that's usually something hurtful that's sad, is something that wounds deeply. So they're they're having the, the poem, the song is creating this atmosphere of the couple fighting, being absent from each other, and, and it's telling us a, a, a story kind of, but it's just trying to elicit uh, the relational realities that happen um, when the honeymoon is over and, and it's hard to connect. Um, I sought him, but I found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. The watchmen found me as they went about in the city. They beat me, they bruised me, they took away my veil, those watchmen of the walls. So remember, part of the theme 
of the Song of Songs is that in the romantic relationship, a God-centered, God-honoring romantic relationship, we can actually experience redemption from the fall that happened in Genesis chapter 3. We'll hit that a lot more later tonight. But also within the romantic relationship, when you're at odds with each other, man, you can re-experience the fall. And the fall is, um, man, uh, you're... To the woman, he said, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And that desire that she wants over her husband is not like, oh, like what is it being expressed here? I want to be loved by you, but it's I want to dominate you. Like sin wanted to to dominate Cain when God told Cain, sin's desire is for you. So the, the, now there's enmity in Genesis chapter 3. Because of the fall, there is now enmity between the woman and the man. And then the man, God says, and he will rule over your, you. And the man and the woman, there's now strife right in the core of the image of God on earth. Male and female, he created them in his image. And there's strife right in between there. And in the romantic relationship, when two people are dying for themselves, for each other, we can get a sense of of, of of the correction, the, the the redemption, the reversal, the reverse of the curse. Um, but also in that romantic relationship, when cues are misread, when our feelings are hurt, we can turn around and re-experience the curse all over again. And that curse has been experienced between male and female, mostly with men dominating women throughout history, because when there's strife, it's usually the strong that dominate the weak. And by and large, for the most part, men are stronger than women and have used that strength um, to exert power and abuse women. And we've gone over statistics for that already. I won't won't rehash that. So she's re-experiencing the curse in the fight now. She's being abused by men all over again. Um, And she says, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him I am sick with love. And then, uh, 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 yeah, she yearns for the romance of old. And the chorus now is going to reply (laughs) and ask a question that gives us um, the first part, or a first part, or a strategy for facing conflict correctly in a romantic relationship. The question says in verse 9, what is your beloved more than another? beloved oh most beautiful among women what is your beloved more than another beloved that you adjure us why do you even care to find him again if he's left you and now you're being hurt again what's the point what what's love got to do got to do with it like why who cares who cares which is and that is a first the first Part one of a, of a simple strategy, not simple, but for a strategy of facing conflict is this. Remember who your beloved is and what he or she really means to you. In broken romantic relationships, relationships that have really fallen far, um, what, what, what we often do is we'll turn what is, has been something good about our beloved into something bad. And we're going to talk about this more later. Even to the extent we'll we'll rewrite um, our uh, 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 story and how we met. You know, the story that we were playful and chasing after each other suddenly becomes, well, he manipulated me and and tricked me, or she manipulated me and tricked me. Like we can, we'll rewrite the stories. Like like, oh man, he was he's so carefree and fun, but whenever we're not good, he's not carefree and fun. He's he's flighty and irresponsible. He's so, she's so responsible and, and on track. She keeps me on track. Well, suddenly that becomes when we're when we're good, she's she's responsible and on track. But whenever we're not good, well, she's rigid and robotic, too analytical. Maybe guys are like that more. I don't know. But when you're when you're in this conflict, if you can start remembering what you actually love and care about about the other person. Then you remember, we have this issue we're fighting over, but we are not this issue. The, the, the problem I'm having with my beloved in this issue, that's not 
the only thing about who my beloved is. And so take your beloved out of that issue and hold them out in front of you and say, oh, you're lovely. You're fun. You Remind yourself who your beloved is. See past the issue to the person and remember the positive place that that person plays in your life. And this is, of course, meant as a strategy for relationships that are actually somewhat healthy. <laughs> Sometimes we have to actually draw boundaries and say, you know, it's not, it's not like, oh, he keeps hitting me, but he's really good at our finances. No, like he's hitting you, you leave, <laughs> right? It's not. So, yeah. Verse 10, so she, she replied. So the, you know, the, the, the course says, well, who, who cares about your beloved? Why? Who is he more than others? Just, just leave him. Well, she says, my beloved is radiant and ruddy, distinguished among 10,000. Like, actually, push comes to shove, no, I don't want anybody else. I remember who he actually is beyond this issue that we're having. He's honorable and handsome. His head is the finest gold. His locks are wavy, black as a raven. Um, um, his eyes are like doves beside streams of water bathed in milk sitting beside a full pool. His, when I look in his eyes, I, am, I find peace because of who he is. And also, I think he's good looking. Verse 13, his Cheeks are like beds of spices, mounds of sweet-smelling herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. I love kissing him. I love this guy. Verse 14, his arms are rods of gold set with jewels. He's a protector, and I like his arms. And verse 14b my translation says his body is polished ivory bedecked with sapphires. The word we get there is the word me'eh again, which we got earlier whenever he, in, in earlier in chapter 5, uh, verse 4, my beloved put his hand to the hole and my me'eh was thrilled within me. And the word me'eh really kind of refers to the source of um, um, uh, for, what, what's the word for reproduction that starts with the people? But for, for making babies, it's the source of making babies. And so, I mean, sometimes it's translated as loins. His his loins is polished ivory. Um, and so it's it's probably talking about his genitalia. Why is it bedeckled with sapphires? I don't know. The, the most simple and likely answer is that this is something that's precious to her. And, and, this, and this, it's not like the 50 shades of, and I remember this, this I know this is awkward, but I remember we're going to talk about crocodiles. And it's something beautiful and lovely and created by God, right? So this is not necessarily like the 50 shades of gray, oversexed culture, like I want my man's penis kind of a way. But perhaps mostly in the like it's something special and intimate that only they share and enjoy together. It's something that it unites them and only them, physically and emotionally. And so it's 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 a precious part. It's a precious thing to her that she that she praises in the presence of God. And and I know it's awkward and spoken in the wrong way. Yes, it's inappropriate. But it's only so only because it's so holy. Like the sexual relationship is what I'm talking about specifically. Like, yeah, um, the name Yahweh is so holy that we, we can't say it, right? But in not saying it, we're not even sure how to pronounce it anymore. And I had a youth, when I was a youth pastor, youth pastor a youth said, how can we say it's special if, if, we forgot to, if we even forgot how to say it? Which is a great question. It's, it's so special, we don't even know what it is anymore. And so, yes, it's so holy that it shouldn't be spoken of out of in the wrong ways, in the wrong times, in the wrong amounts. But it's also holy enough to talk about it so that we can honor it for what it is. Yeah. Um, so that's why she praises it, is because it's something special that unites them before God in a godly way. So it's precious to her. Verse 15. 
His legs are alabaster columns set on bases of gold. Gold, his appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. Um, she, she is saying that he is majestic to her. His mouth is most sweet, and he is altogether desirable. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Why him and no other? Why him? They called out to her. And she said, because he is my friend. He is peace to my soul. He is joy to me. We share intimate things that we don't share with anybody else. My beloved is my beloved. She longs to taste his kisses. In the midst of conflict, she teaches us. And remember, the, she is almost always the hero in the Song of Songs. The woman is. She teaches us to remember that the identity of our beloved does not have to be found only in the midst of the current conflict. Our relationship is not defined by the issue we're going through. Um, chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. Where has your beloved gone, O most beautiful among women? Where has your beloved turned that we may seek him? My beloved has gone down to his garden, to the beds of spices, to graze in the gardens and to gather lilies. This second question and her answer reveals to us the second part of a strategy for handling conflict correctly. The first question moved her to reflect upon him and not the issue, to, fo not, to not focus, to not connect his identity directly to the issue. And uh, now, um, um, the question, where is your beloved? He's enjoying his garden, enjoying the spices. Now, chapter 5, verse 1 says, I came, he says, I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank wine with my milk. And so she's saying, where, 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 they say, where is he? He says he's gone down to his garden to the beds of his spices to graze in the garden and gather lilies. So is he all, are they all of a sudden having sex again? Um, I think that what she's doing is poetically she's remembering that chapter 5 has happened. Chapter 5 verse 1 has happened. That they have given themselves to each other. Um, if she'll look past the issue, she'll remember that he is hers. They've committed themselves. Wherever, wherever he is, she is believing, believing that he is hers. And so she says, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. He grazes among the lilies. Now earlier in chapter 2, verse 16, she said that he shepherds among the lilies. And at that point in the song, the clearest interpretation in the context was he's among many lilies, but I am his and he's mine. But there's lots of girls that he can walk around, that he can shepherd around. But but I'm his, and he's mine. We're reminded that in a field of flowers, in a world of fields of flowers, he has chosen her, and she has chosen him. The other lilies aren't a threat. They're actually just a reminder of the choice that the, 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 the woman and man have made for each other. In the midst of conflict, she rem remembers who he is, that she, he has chosen her, and that she has chosen him. He is hers. She is his. So they can move through conflict and relationships to, to each other, remembering the identity of the other that is not defined by the conflict, and also remembering their commitments to each other that is not defined by the conflict. So remembering their love for the other, remembering their commitment to each other, that's how they engage the conflict. Do you see the difference? Because what happens a lot of times when we engage in conflicts in relationships is what happens is, is there's a conflict about, I don't know, um, finances. But while we're discussing finances, what happens? Well, you don't trust me. Well, you're irresponsible. And so instead of talking about finances, suddenly we're actually fighting about our identities. You don't trust me, you're irresponsible. 
if instead of, of, of drawing our identities into the issue, we can keep our identities separate from the issue. And remember that, that, that I, I, I focus on my love for you and who you are, and we focus on our commitments to each other. Well, this is a relational reality, and this is something that we can deal with from this place of our relational reality. And we can keep the issue the issue and not attack each other's identities. Verse 4, he says, You are beautiful as Tirzah, my love, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Man, he has seen her respond to his idiocy of getting his pride hurt and running away from her and saying something mean to her, and that she has pursued him in her pain, in her the abuse she's received from the watchmen in the walls, whatever that means metaphorically, she has still pursued him with this focus on who he is to her as a beloved and who they are to each other. And so now he sees her as something as awesome as an army with banners. He is intimidated and in awe of who she is. Turn away your eyes from me for they over Whelm me. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Uh oh. I don't know if you remember the honeymoon night from chapter four, but that's how it all started. He noticed her hair leaping down the slopes of Gilead. She let her hair down, and he liked it. Here we go. They're reliving the honeymoon now. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes that have come up from the washing. They're all your teeth are white. All of them bear twins. Not one of them have been lost. It's young. All your teeth are there. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. Your cheeks are rosy. They're pretty. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. Now, this was not said on the honeymoon. This is something new. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one. The only one of her mother, pure to her who bore her. The young women saw her and called her blessed. The queens and concubines also, and they praised her. Who is this who looks down like the dawn, beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, Awesome as an army with banners. They relive the honeymoon, but now it's so much deeper and richer because of the issues, the conflicts they've gone through. Man, I tell you what, mine and Becca's wedding was awesome. And some of y'all might have been there. Trudy, were you there? Like all, all of BT was there. It was. And then some of First Baptist Edinburgh, because I was just about to go work at First Baptist Edinburgh. Like, there was like 1,500 people there. It was, it was like we were like celebrities. And so we, we milked it. The ceremony was like an hour and 45 minutes long. It was, it was crazy. But, 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 but whatever. Like, um, man, we were such kids. And we had those commitments to each other, and, and we meant them. It was, it was a big deal, vows, until death do us part, right? Like I, and, and when I do weddings – in the vows I add, um, and, and in this moment, before God and friends and family, I vow to you, I will never divorce you. Like that's what I put in the vows. Because that's what actually till death do us part means. It's just become so normal we don't remember. But the, the, the vows are heavy, right? But I tell you what, when Becca chooses me today, it means more than it did on that day because there's a lot more behind that choice. It's a lot more of a mature choice. It's a lot more of an intentional choice. Now she's choosing not just the best of me that she sees, but the worst of me that she knows. And so after the honeymoon, when the honeymoon's over and you move through it anyway, handling conflict well, you can relive the honeymoon but in such a deeper way where now it's not just 
I'm going to climb I'm going to climb your trees and take hold of your fruit, which is great. But now you can also say, who is this who looks down like the dawn, beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, awesome as an army with banners? Love can grow through conflict. It doesn't have to fade through conflict. She says, I went down to the nut orchard to look at the blossoms of the valley to see whether the vines had budded, whether the pomegranates were in bloom. He had promised her, remember, when they were dating, he had promised her. He called her out of the clefts of the rock. He said, winter's over, spring has come, and she's checking on that. When he retreated from her, she was wounded. It was like winter came back, and now she's going down to check to make sure that springtime has really come again for her with him. Verse 12, before I was aware, my desire set me among the chariots of my kinsmen, a prince. This is an old anthology of songs in Hebrew. There's idioms, Hebrew idioms that we maybe we don't remember or know anymore. Texts can be change scholars just say that verse 12 is incredibly difficult to translate and understand um my best shot at it is she suddenly discovers that her desire and the hebrew word for her soul before i was aware my soul set me in the chariots of and the word is aminabib at face value it simply means my people a prince so in light of chapter 7, verse 11, he calls her Bat Nabib, or princely daughter. It seems that this could be a term of endearment, loosely translated as my princely beloved. Since Ami can also be translated as my uncle, which oddly enough can mean beloved. Um, in chapter 6, verse 3, beloved translates the Hebrew word Dodi, which means my uncle as well. So Dodi, um, Ami, my uncle, beloved. Um, maybe it was like a little idiom um, that maybe lost on us. Um, and so maybe she thought Ami Nabib sounded sweeter than Dodi Nabib. Maybe it's easier to say. At any rate, as she inspects the spring, she finds that her soul has led her to the chariots of her princely beloved. Her very soul has handed her over to her beloved, and he is princely. Her commitment to him goes down to her depths. She rides in his chariots and no one else's. So for this section, every marriage will go through seasons of honeymoon, disillusionment, and God willing, recommitment. Many, if not most, will journey through this um, in a meta-narrative kind of way. Like sometimes that's you can look back on a marriage and say that's the big story. We got married, it was awesome, and we had like a big season in the middle. <laughs> it was rough, and we came through that big season. And that can be like the, the, the big timeline of many marriages. I can say that it's been a part of the big story of me and Becca so far. Because there was a season where we weren't really sure that we were going to make it. And that would have been really embarrassing um, as a pastor, <laughs> which is not fair for me or for Becca, but it, it, it is what it is. But we can also have those. There's also going to be many seasons of that, many seasons of everything's easy, disillusionment, and recommitment. So, honeymooners, if, you, if you're newly wed, be ready. Remember to distinguish between the issues that you're discussing and you and your beloved. <laughs> Your beloved and you are not the issues you discuss. When conflict arises, as you work through the issue, make sure you continually reflect on your love for your beloved, their love for you. Remember the commitment that you've given to each other. Remember the community of support that you have in the church and your friends and family. Look past the issues and remember your relationship. Not, I'm not saying forget the issues. you got to deal with the issues. They're there. But deal with them as who you are, not as... Deal with them as if deal with them as you. Don't let them define who you are. Words are hard. 
Um, and that's something that you practice, by the way. That's something that you practice. It doesn't just, it, it, if you don't practice that before the really hard times come, you won't be ready when the hard times come. Practice in the little things. Disillusion couples. If you're in a place of disillusionment with your marriage, reflect on the love of your, your, your youth. Um, wounds can be healed. Honeymoon can be relived with greater commitment and intimacy. Find good, biblical, psychologically sound counseling. Get therapy. Cynthia, I know that you were trying to kill a bug, but I'm going to pretend like you were clapping because that's really important. Get good, biblical, <laughs> theologically sound, psychologically sound therapy. Um, yeah. Uh, committed couples, enjoy. And if you've gone through that phase, be, be present for younger couples. Younger couples need to see um, older couples, seasoned couples doing it well. All right. Um, here's just a little thing to, to kind of rephrase what we've already been talking about, about what can happen in a marriage that will also launch us into this next section. They met in college. She was immediately drawn to his larger-than-life personality and charming disposition. Every moment she spent with him was fun and filled with life. He thought she was beautiful, and he loved how intelligent and incredibly competent she was in her life choices. Soon after graduation, they married. But something weird happened after seven years of marriage. It seemed that life, their jobs, the kids, financial pressures and issues with their extended families just pulled them apart to where they were living parallel lives more than sharing life together. And as they drifted apart, their views on each other changed. She no longer saw him as adventurous and larger than life. She started calling him irresponsible and immature. Egotistical was her favorite word to use when they started fighting. He no longer saw her as intelligent and competent with life decisions. He thought of her as a robot who was afraid to live life. He soon stopped arguing with her and would simply say under his breath, Yes, your majesty. He expected her to critique his jokes and daily schedule, and she expected him to neglect what was important to her, like picking up the dry cleaning or taking out the trash. Those expectations led each of them to see the worst in each other and attack it. Their passion for each other and their shared goals for life together were gone, washed away behind negative expectations. Neither knew what they wanted to do, divorce and get out of the relationship, or just stick it out and live together for the kids. It's a great book called Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work by, um, I don't remember his first name, his last name is Gottman. There's a whole Gottman Institute. It has great little, there's a great app, actually, if you want to start practicing some stuff with your spouse. Um, but according to Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, this is a common occurrence for unhealthy marriage marriages, where they start rewriting their story, and rewriting their vision of the other person toward the negative. But whether or not a marriage will get to this stage in their estrangement, um, it's not uncommon for the passion of a couple's shared life together to fade. And so in the Song of Songs, we get to a place to ask ourselves, ask ourselves does passion have to fade? Does a couple have to get to a place like this? And if not, how do we keep it from getting there? And if it does, how do we restore it? So let's look at Song of Songs to see if this God-breathed perspective on romance presents us with a fading passion. So we're going to jump forward a little bit, and then we'll come back. We're going to jump forward real quick to chapter 7, verses 11 through 13. The bride gives her love. She says, Come, my beloved, let us go out into the fields and lodge in the villages. Let us go out early to the vineyards and see whether the vines have budded, whether the grape blossoms have opened and the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. The mandrakes give forth fragrance, and beside our doors are all choice fruits, new as well as old, which I have laid up for you, my beloved. 
We've read about dating and courtship. We've read about marriage and godly sex. We've read about disillusionment and conflict in marriage and how that can lead to greater commitment. Now we're reading about a couple who has spent a significant part of their lives together long enough to have old fruits. She says, come, come out to the, to, to the countryside with me, which is actually a place of, of love. Come to the countryside with me. And she says, she says, beside our doors are all choice fruits, new as well as old. They have old fruits in their relationships to enjoy together. And they also have new fruits to enjoy together. So their passion isn't gone. Passion doesn't have to fade. Verse 13, after this time of disillusionment and reconnection, now in verse 13, we read, Return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. Um, this is a weird passage. Um, um, basically, I think that um, the, what's going on here is a dance. Return, return, it can't say like turn, like spin and spin. And so um, 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 in, 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 in chapter 6, verse 13, um, wait, yeah, in 13b, it says, Why should you look upon the Shulamite as upon a dance before two armies? And so there's a reference to a dance. And so I, th I think, I th basically, I think that she's dancing for him. The word, the word Shulamite uh, could be like made of Shulam. Um, the only named person in the poem is Solomon so far. And who's, the, the Hebrew for Solomon is, is Shlomo. So you can't say it very fast. You have to say it in Shlomo. Get it? Um, so um, both of these names, Shlomo and, and, and made of Shulam, Shulamite, can be derived from the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace. So the consequence of the union between the man and the woman is found within these names, peace. Longman says, in their intimacy, they achieve a wholeness that brings great peace or contentment. Um, and so this peace will even be represented as a reversal of the curse from Genesis 3, as we've been talking about. So does this peace and wholeness mean, mean some sort of monkish and reserved relationship, some kind of passionless relationship? I, I think that what's going on here is that she is dancing for him, like like you know like like a like a Middle Eastern dance, um, or I don't know. However, women might dance for their husbands these days. Um, and and for the record, I think it's a beautiful poetic device as the chorus, this outside entity that acts as a muse or sounding board for the woman's love, calls her out to return to dance before her love. Turn, turn, spin, spin, dance before your beloved. I think God is encouraging the couple to intentionally return to each other, to maintain their passion for each other. And it comes out as if she's dancing for him. Perhaps the, the dance has between, as before, two armies. Maybe that's the name of the dance. I don't know. Perhaps it's like uh, he's entranced by her dance, as one would be entranced watching two armies in a battlefield. Either way, I think she's dancing for him, and he's enthralled by the dance. Um. Chapter 7, verse 1, how beautiful are your feet in sandals, O noble daughter. Your rounded thighs are like jewels, the work of a master hand. Uh, he calls her noble daughter. And so he's going to describe this noble queen of, her, of his. He's going to describe her beauty again. Usually he started from her head, go down to her feet. Now he's going to start from her feet and go up, work his way up. So let's see. If this seasoned love has become disimpassioned. Verse 2 Your navel is a rounded bowl that never lacks mixed wine. Your belly is a heap of wheat. Mm, wouldn't that just inspire you women? Your belly is a heap of wheat encircled with lilies. Um, so many commentators uh, do not believe he's talking about her belly button here. Um, as much as I could study it, I call it a tie. Is it her belly button or is it um, her most private area? Um, he could be talking about either here, either one here. Um, and then he says her belly is a heap of wheat. 
Um, what in the world does that mean? I really like this summary from one of the commentaries I used to study Song of Songs. It says, the Hebrew baton, belly, womb, or stomach, is an ambiguous term, and it appears that this verse makes much of its ambiguity. On one level, the verse speaks of the simple beauty of her navel and curved waist, like a bound of a bound sheaf of wheat. You, you bound a wheat, you tie it in the middle, and the shape of the wheat is the shape of a woman. You know, and so he's like, "Hey, your belly is like the shape of wheat." On another level, it suggests her genital area as well as sexual arousal. On the third level, it speaks of her as one who has the power of fertility in her belly. Your belly is like a, a sheaf of wheat. Well, well, well wheat is, 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 is the production of a fertile field. And he's acknowledging at this stage in their relationship that her body, her belly, has the ability to create life, to be fertile, which is the longer <laughs> you're married, um, a beautiful aspect of womanhood. Um, in other words, the meaning of the verse should not be limited either to the woman's navel and waist or simply to her vagina and sexual arousal, but should encompass her whole belly with all its beauty, sexuality, and fertile power. I think that's an awesome poetic device, and that kind of deep adoration for a woman's body comes with time shared together in a seasoned love and not a passionless love. Verse 3, your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. He still loves her fawns. Verse 4, your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are pools in Heshbon by the gate of Bat Ravim. Your nose is like a tower of Lebanon, which looks toward Damascus. Ugh. And she wanted to be told your nose looks like a tower. So your neck, you're noble and strong. Your eyes, your look refreshes me like a pool. Your nose, like a tower, I don't know, it's straight. It's properly placed. Because um, uh, a, a tower that's properly placed doesn't draw attention to itself, but it accentuates the landscape. Maybe, I don't know. Her nose is a beautiful piece of the architecture of her face. That's maybe the best way to say it. Verse 5, your head crowns you like Carmel. Your flowing locks like purple, a king is held captive in its tresses. Mount Carmel was a magnificently beautiful and a sacred place in Israel. Purple hair speaks of royalty. So, so far, it's not a passionless relationship that they have together. These words are deep. He, is, he has a matured respect and adoration for her. But I don't hear any... Um, Maybe we don't hear any of the old passion, like when he said, I'm going to go away to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of Frank frankincense all night long, like he said on their honeymoon. Well, we're not done yet. Verse 6, how beautiful and pleasant you are, O loved one, with all your delights. Your stature is like a palm tree, and your breasts are its clusters. I say I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its fruit. Oh, may your breasts be like clusters of the vine and the scent of your breath like apples. In your mouth like the best wine. Um, they haven't lost their passion for each other. So how have they done it? How have they kept the passion? Well, first, like we've already talked about, they've been intentional even in times of conflict to remember their love for each other. They've been focused on remembering their commitment to each other. Second, their intentional remembering of each other's love helped them handle conflict the right way because they were intentional about putting their friendship first, remembering how they loved their spouse and how their spouse loved them. Friendship is such a vital part of a romantic relationship. Third, and perhaps this is of first importance, they loved each other in such a way as to journey together beyond the curse of Genesis 3. We've got here, we've now landed to what is my favorite part, the Song of Songs, I think a key verse in it. Chapter 7, verse 10. She says, I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. And we've gone over this before. When she says, his desire is for me, this is the third time in all the Old Testament that the word, that phrase, desire for another, is used. 
It's first used in 3.16, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Then it's used in Genesis 4.7, um, God telling Cain, sin's desires for you. And now here, almost verbatim, um, but it's not the woman doing desiring, it's the man. And his desire isn't against her, it's for her. It's not attributed to the sin. It's now actually a consequence of their enduring love. She says, I am my beloved's. She isn't saying that she's become the heroine of the extreme feminist. Um, now she's crawled out from underneath the man's foot and she's going to put the man under her foot. It's not, it's not the battle of the sexes for her. She is saying, I'm his. And his desire for her is likened to a deep-seated desire that is so strong it could almost be something dangerous if his desire was against her instead of for her. It's something unhealthy when one partner desires the other and the other rules over the desirer. But when two decide to love each other as Christ and the church, laying down themselves for a godly relationship, it's the picture of the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Delight, the Garden of Pleasure. They have found a way to live without trying to one-up each other. There's no fear of who's dominating who. The idea of one ruling over the other isn't even a part of their world. They live life together, supporting each other, enjoying each other. They found a piece of heaven's peace, peace of heaven's wholeness on earth in their godly romance. Um, a secret to maintaining passion in a relationship is to know the other. Sometimes the Bible uses an interesting word for sex, yada, and Adam knew Eve. And the word yada means to know. If you want to know your partner well, you need to know your partner well. That's a good, that's a good one. If, you know, if, 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 if it wasn't so late on y'all's end and we were, you know, like, like um, a charismatic um, institution, you'd be like, mm, yes, bring it. If you want to know your partner well in the biblical sense, you need to know your partner well. To be a friend is to have a special knowledge of another person. You know things about that person. You know their dreams and their hopes, their fears, their joys, their hobbies, their failures, their successes, their day-to-day -day momentum in life. A great marriage will be a great friendship between two people who are always growing in their knowledge of each other so they can support and show up for each other in specific, intentional, meaningful ways. you got to study each other. If you want to know each other well, you got to know each other well. Um, the Gottman Institute has some great resources to build a good love map of knowing your spouse. So here's the, the passage we started out with. Remember, we jumped ahead. We jumped ahead to this passage, 7-11. Um, Come, my beloved, let us go out to the fields and lodge in the villages. Let us go out early to the vineyards and see whether the vines have budded, whether the grape blossoms have opened and the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. The mandrakes give forth fragrance, and beside our doors are all choice fruits, new as well as old, which I have laid up for you, O oh, my beloved. She says, let's get out of here. Let's go enjoy the countryside together. I love spending time with you. And by the way, I know you like the fruits I shared with you in our youth, but wait till you get a load of these new fruits I've stored up for you. They know each other so well. They know their old fruits, and they're capable of discovering new fruits together. So if, if you want to have a relationship that grows in passion with new fruits, spend the time to get to know each other. Man, I, I need to shut my blinds, don't I? Um, all right. We're heading to the last chapter of the Song of Songs. Um, we're going to come face to face with why the redemption of romance is so important. Why sex can take over a life or a culture so powerfully. God's design of romantic love is an intentional establishment of the enduring legacy of his image on creation. Okay, so we're going to hit the last section, the last chapter in Song of Songs, and one of this is this is one of the reasons why I love Song of Songs so much is not just because I think we need to redeem our view of the romantic relationship and sex specifically as a church who worships the God who created it all, but also because I think 
that this gives us a view that helps us process through why maybe the romantic relationship and sex specifically can be so powerful for both good and evil in our world, why our appetite for food doesn't usually affect us quite as negatively as an, an over, like an unhealthy appetite for, for sexuality can. Um, um, we're going to come face to face with why redemption, the redemption of romance is so important. God's design of romantic love is an intentional establishment of the enduring legacy of his image on creation. From the beginning, God made them male and female. God's image consisted of the two sexes who are able to join together as a one and in doing so, join with God in the act of creation. Man, I wish we could just, you know, we read books like Lord of the Rings and, 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 and we get excited about you know, the ants, the trees that can walk, you know, we're like, oh, like, what if, if only creation could be that, like, magical and, and, and that we could be a part of it in that magical kind of way. Like, guys, God spoke everything into existence. And then as a picture of himself, he created these, this, the, the, these two beings, male and female, who can, because of his design, Come together and then co-create the image of God on earth. Can create souls, living beings with volition. Like that is crazy Harry Potter supernatural kind of stuff. We swim in a spiritual supernatural world. Representing the God of creation as his image that can participate in in creation of the crown of the creation co-create his image with him so that the image of god might shine all around the world that's the legacy that the husband and wife relationship represents after sin entered the world and humanity and creation fell from its original intent. God moved to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then to Moses to create a people to draw humanity back toward himself. And he gave ten commandments through Moses. And the first four commandments deal with humanity's relationship with God, right? The last six deal with humanity's relationship with humanity. Don't steal, don't covet, all that stuff. Well, the very first commandment of the six that focus on our relationships with each other is honor your father and mother. Because that commandment is actually a transition between honoring God and honoring people. Because people are the image of God. And the very first picture of the image of God was the male-female relationship. The transition in the Ten Commandments between our relationship with God and our relationship relationship in community with other humans is honor the original picture of the image of God on earth, male and female, mother and father. Humanity is supposed to be the image of God, male and female, in submission to God, joining together with each other in order to join together with God in filling his world up with his image. When honorable parents... Raise children to honor their parents, the picture of God in the home. They grow up to, those kids grow up to be honorable parents who raise children to honor the picture of God in the home and be honorable parents who raise up their children. You see that God's plan for humanity is, is, is for it to just reverberate with his image and his creative beautiful power the, and at the, at, at the foundation of us as the image of God is this romantic relationship created and blessed by God.
The God-centered love between husband and wife is the foundation for a godly society, the, the foundation for an image of God on earth. That's the legacy of love that God created. Of course, sex can have a powerful effect on hu humans, whether negatively or positively. It is so wrapped up and tied up into the foundation of the image of God on earth. Whatever your status is in regard to romantic love, you can seek to uphold and honor God's ideal to leave a legacy of godly love. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul explains how Christ's relationship with the church is to be mirrored in the marriage relationship. And as he's talking about that, if you read it, it's really funny. He almost forgets, like, am I talking about marriage now or am I talking about Christ in the church? He's like, nah, well, I know what I'm saying applies to Christ in the church. But husbands should love their wives and wives should respect their husbands. <laughs> God's plan for a marriage and God's love toward humanity cannot help but parallel one another so closely because the relationship between man and woman was the very first picture of God on creation. People should look at our marriages, the marriages in the church, and have a better understanding of who Jesus is, of what Christ's relationship with his church is. Perhaps because of our marriages, people could come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. That was the very first picture of Yahweh on earth, and it's now a picture of Christ's relationship with the church. There's an eternal legacy for godly love between husband and wife. That's why I think it's so cool to go through the book of Song of Songs to see the voice, the, 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 the picture, the poetry that, 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 that God has inspired in his word uh, to call us to see the romantic relationship for the beautiful thing that it is. Love is awesome. And if we love biblically, we can leave a legacy of love that can transform generations. Song of Songs closes with a poetic address to love's legacy. Let's read Song of Songs 8, 1 through 14. She says to him, Oh, that you were like a brother to me who nursed at my mother's breast. If I found you outside, I would kiss you, and none would despise me. There's some weird stuff. Like, you know, at face value, you're like, You wish I was your brother? Like, that's not good. <laughs> not a good desire. The Bible's not supporting incest here. Um, in this time, <laughs> in this time, it seems as though. Uh, PDA between the husband and wife was frowned upon. And so it was actually more appropriate to have a physical affection with your brother in public, like hugging your brother and, and you know, maybe giving your brother a kiss on the cheek or whatever. That was more acceptable. You were more free to hug a brother in public than a husband. And she's like, man, I wish you were my brother so I could hug you right now. I want to embrace you, and I. Uh, this is hard to like. Be appropriate in public. Verse two, she says, "I will lead you and bring you into the house of my mother, she who used to teach me. I will give you spiced wine to drink, the juice of my pomegranate." Um, your translation probably reads, "I would lead you, or I would give you." It's the imperfect form of the Hebrew verb, and it can be used in different ways. Uh, most translations take it like that, the would, uh, I would give you, like the more subjunctive mood because of the wishful tone in the verse before it. But I, I, I like to read it more as a future tense, that she is contrasting her inability to show affection publicly now to what she's going to do in private later. I can't kiss you and embrace you in public, but I will do so in private. I'm going to lead you and bring you into the house of my mother, which, ladies, if you want to get your husbands in the mood, 
don't say let's go to your mother-in-law's house just just kidding i love my mother-in-law just a little joke a little joke a little joke why in the weird world why in the weird world would she say let's go to mom's house um it's actually a wonderfully poetic statement about the legacy of love this woman sees herself metaphorically entering the house of her mother as now she is herself taking on that identity she's taking on the identity of a feminine lover um, a feminine leader in the household she's now the woman of the house uh, one commentary said in the song the woman is the domain of sexual and domestic love and now the woman in the song sees herself stepping into that legacy of love that was left behind by her own mother it's actually a beautiful thing verse 3 his right hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me I adjure you O daughters of Jerusalem that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases so if you remember at the very early stages of this song um, he was wooing her and she got to the place where she said this and this refrain came up and it was clear that at that time it was not the appropriate time to awaken the kind of love where his hand is going to be under her head not behind her head but under her head while his other hand embraces her that's the sexual position and it was not time then but now it is time and now this refrain that earlier in the song said not yet not yet now this refrain that says don't awaken it until the proper time says since we waited it's so good now it's worth waiting for what was a warning don't do it too early is now a celebration um, yeah no matter where you are in your sexual journey by god's grace you can seek his his ideal beginning now and god's ideal of sex is worth pursuing wherever you are whenever you can verse five who is that coming up from the wilderness leaning on her beloved at the wedding in chapter 3 verse 6 it was the man coming up out of the wilderness in a pillar of smoke leaving the wilderness for the promised land of milk and honey we read about in 411 now it's the woman leaving the wilderness on the arm of her beloved she's escaped the dangers of the wilderness of the fall and is experiencing the promised land of peaceful godly romance under the apple tree i awakened you there your mother was in labor with you there she who bore you was in labor under the apple tree was a place of sweet nourishment and protection for the woman earlier in the psalm and in, in, in song in chapter 2 verse 3 and from that place she aroused her man apparently this is just how the man's mother operated with his father his mother found sweet nourishment and protection under his father's shadow and his mother aroused his father in that shadow it says there your mother was in labor with you there she who bore you was in labor um and so um the man's wife now says that the man is walking in his father's legacy of love just as the woman walks in her mother's legacy of love this is the ideal how we desire our society to operate husband and wife fathers and mothers leaving godly legacies of love for their children to walk in verse 6 and 7 set me as a seal upon your heart as a seal upon your arm for love is strong as death jealousy as fierce as the grave its flashes are flashes of fire the very flame of Yahweh love is the most powerful force on earth of course I'm not just talking about romantic love but God is love and he he created his image on earth and the first picture was the male-female relationship they can co-create life on earth here she wants the man to set her as a seal on his arm and on her heart as a stamp of ownership he is hers he is sealed up away from any other 
Um, jokingly, I wonder if this is almost a warning to the guy. Like, you bear my seal. You're my lover. Remember, jealousy is as strong as the grave, honey. Strong as the grave. Jealousy, strong as the grave. So just keep talking to that girl. Jealousy is strong as the grave. I will kill you. It's flashes are flashes of the fire of the brightest flame. But it's true that if either, either one of them operates outside the bounds of the definition of love and romance that we've learned from the Song of Songs to this point, love can feel like a flood of flames that burns hotter than death. We should seal up the definition of love and sexuality within the parameters that we've learned from the Song of Songs. It's strong enough to carry us to places of God's garden of shalom and pleasure, and it's strong enough to destroy us in flames. It's unquenchable, unquenchable and it cannot be purchased by worldly means. Love is awesome, and if we love biblically, we can leave a legacy of love that can transform generations. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. Verses 8 and 9. We have a little sister, and she has no breasts. What shall we do for our, our sister in the day when she is spoken for? If she's a wall, we'll build on her a battlement of silver. If she's a door, we'll enclose her with boards of cedar. These verses speak on the preciousness of virginity, calling back to the, the identity of the woman. Um, they say, our little sister's too young for marriage. She doesn't have breasts yet. We're going to protect her virginity. If she's a wall, we'll prepare the wall for sieges that are going to come against it. Men are jerks, and we're going to build battlements to protect her. Um, but if she's a door, <laughs> like if she's an open door, we're going to close that door with boards of cedar. <laughs> we are going to do everything we can to help her be safe because guys are jerks and the curse has led to men taking advantage of women. And Song of Songs calls men to do the opposite of that. Not that women are helpless without a man or helpless without men. Just saying that the reversal of the course, the curse, is men um, caring for and exalting anybody that they can, and maybe mostly women. I don't know. Maybe I'm old-fashioned or out of touch. I don't know. I don't know. Um, they protect her with silver and cedar, precious items because she's precious. Her innocence is precious. We need to guard the innocence of our daughters and also, guys, of our sons. Goodness gracious, this world can attack our sons. Um, it's terrifying that our culture is not only largely failing to protect the innocence of our children, but in some cases we're even encouraging them to abandon the parameters of love the Bible clearly outlines. Casual sex, homosexuality, pornography, self-identifying genders, Mutilating our children. It's crazy. It's a crazy destruction, a uh, uh, defilement of the image of God on earth, the very first picture of God on earth. Uh, if I said homosexuality, I shouldn't have said homosexuality. I, sh I should have said like, homosexual activity. Um, temptation is not a sin. If we want to encourage the world to accept God's design for romance, then we need to leave a positive example of the legacy of love for our children. We've learned from the Song of Songs, not just protest what we're against, but demonstrate what we're for. Verse 10, we're going to get through this. She says, I was a wall, and my breasts were like towers. Don't tell me I don't have a breath. Then I was in his eyes as one who finds peace. The woman turns this metaphor of a wall around to a humorous look about her giving away her virginity. She says, I was a wall, but then my breast became towers. She was protected, but then she came of age. She was in her beloved's eyes of shalom, and she came of age and stood and laid in his eyes. So she found peace. To move from virginity to 
intimacy and a godly marriage is a thing of shalom. This is the legacy we want to leave. Verses 11 and 12. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Hamon. He let out the vineyard to keepers. Each one was to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, my very own, is before me. You, O Solomon, may have a thousand, and the keepers of the fruit, two thousand. So there's this there's debate here. Like, is the guy throughout the poem Solomon? Uh, this passage seems to argue against that. Um, because they're talking to Solomon now, though there's some interpretations that do go that direction. I follow the school of thought that says Solomon's name is conjured here to evoke certain emotions um, at this point in, 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 in the, the book. It was conjured earlier at the wedding time to conjure up scenes of, 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 of royalty and the glory of the crowning day, that, 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 that the wedding day for the man was like being crowned king over God's people. Um, here it's used to conjure up how Solomon in his later days used love and marriage as a means to worldly ends, political power and personal pleasure void of interpersonal intimacy. He has a vineyard, he has thousands, he, have all, he has all of this. Um, Bel Hamon basically translates to Lord of a Mob. Lord of a Mob. The point of this passage is that Solomon has many lovers. He is a mob of lovers, but he does not enjoy the full vineyard of any of his lovers. The vineyard representing the woman's emotional, mental, spiritual, and physical intimacy. Instead, he leaves others to take care of them. He doesn't know the joy of tending his own vineyard personally. He doesn't know the vineyard on daily, intimate terms in, in order to partake of the fruit of intimacy. He doesn't know the smell of the soil, the ebb and flow of the vines. He doesn't know how to pluck the fruit from the vine in a loving, healthy way. He only knows how to consume the fruit that others tend for him. The woman can now say, remember back in chapter one, she said, I couldn't keep my own vineyard. But now she can say she keeps her own vineyard. She tends to her vineyard, and it is only for her husband to share it. Basically, this is telling Solomon, you can have the mob. <laughs> We're going to celebrate the intimacy of our vineyard together. There's a lot of ways to enjoy sex in this world. The song sings to us that the best way to enjoy the fruit of the vineyard of romance is in God's design of marriage. And other ways kind of end up, in the end, sad. Verse 13 and 14. O you who dwell in the gardens with companions listening for your voice, let me hear it. Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. The song closes as the man honors the woman's voice. Let me hear your voice. It's a voice for companions to listen to. He wants to hear her voice. Her voice is powerful. And she speaks. He says, sweetie, your voice. It's time for your voice to be heard. And what does she say? She doesn't speak to the companions at all. She speaks to him. She calls him to hurry up and be a young stag on the mountains of spices. That doesn't mean she won't use her voice for others. It's just that her first voice is always for him. Their love is central in their life. The Song of Songs ends in this word of longing. Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. Romantic love is never satisfied. It's full for a moment, but that moment is not enough for a lifetime. When that moment's over, the longing will return, and that can be a good thing. A longing of love points to the eternal intimacy we're created for, an intimate love relationship with God. We've already looked at how the Gospel of John paints the ministry, the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ as a divine proposal and even as the uh, fulfillment of a love relationship with God. The Song of Songs ends a lot like the book of Revelation. How does Revelation end? 22.17, the spirit and the bride say, 
come. And the one who hears says, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. And in verse 20, Jesus says, surely I am coming soon. We end with longing in the love book that God gave us in the Bible. We have a longing for true, intimate love, and that only comes through Jesus Christ. And that's how the book of Song of Songs ends too, with longing. He came to earth to betroth us to himself, and soon he's returning to receive us as his eternal bride. And we cry out in longing, Lord, return and receive us. In the meantime, may our romance be a picture for the world to see of the love and longing that we have for our Lord Jesus Christ. What a legacy of love we have. What a gift we have in the Song of Songs to remind us of who God is, who we are, and how we can reflect his love to the world together. Amen. We did it. We did it, guys. Any questions or comments on Song of Songs?